morning at 11.38 after a couple of delays for several hours. There is a crack in the universe. Well, I was a teacher in a small town in the east of Holland. And on a Sunday, with beautiful weather, the sun shining, I saw there young British pilots falling to their death. And that gave uh, me the impression that life is tragic. And now that the whole world has seen people exploding in the air, I think that more people will agree with me and accept that life is tragic and at the same time has to be accepted as beautiful and worthwhile. I think these Gnostics were right. There is a crack in the universe. Perhaps God is not only good, but he has also a dark side. And to find uh, God, even in the dark and shadowy side of existence and of the world, that perhaps is the most important and most difficult contribution of Gnosis to modern life. When Gnostic scriptures were discovered in Upper Egypt 40 years ago, scholars such as Professor Quispel faced a dilemma in translating and interpreting the earliest library of Christian texts ever discovered. Their value seemed unlimited as evidence of the original doctrines of Christianity and even of the actual words of Christ, for there were Gnostic Gospels among the papyrus books. Yet the Christian churches partly owe their existence and their long-term survival to the rejection of such books and their symbolic interpretation of early Christianity as heresy. For 2,000 years, the Gnostic Christian has been a heretic. But the pulse of Gnosis has continued to beat beneath the skin of the Christian world. Gnosis is of the same root as the English word knowledge, to know. But it is not an intellectual knowledge. It is more a sort of intuitive thinking, imaginative thinking. They themselves call it the knowledge of the heart. 
With the publication of the mystical Gnostic scriptures from Nag Hammadi, scholars and historians can now consider the role of Gnosticism within the established Christian tradition. The spiritual impulse of Gnosis is a constant quest for self-knowledge and knowledge of God. Today, the knowledge of the heart is shared by millions. Many are within the modern churches. Others pursue spiritual knowledge and self-awareness through physical fitness, diet, music, or meditation. Gnosticism interests people who find themselves somewhat either disaffected or uninvolved or uh, with the churches as they are, or asking, what does this mean? You know, what are the, these strange ancient symbols, you know, what, what kind of inner meaning, if any, could it possibly have? And people who are restless in a way spiritually, and they do want to go on a kind of spiritual search and, and find something that is valid or powerful or meaningful in their own lives. And I think for such people, this is, a, this is an option, or it is at least a vision of a way that people have gone. And some people take it as kind of permission to do that. Modern man may still feel the pulse beat of Gnosis in history. 500 years ago, Renaissance philosophy centered upon the Gnostic idea of hermitism, which placed man at the center of the universe and developed, often underground, in alchemy and magic. In medieval France, the rejection of dogma and the quest for salvation through spiritual knowledge was the essence of the Cathar heresy eliminated by Roman Catholic Inquisitors and the Albigensian Crusade. But the stream of Gnosis flows first from Egypt and other Christian areas in the first two centuries after Christ. The pioneering Swiss psychologist Carl Gustav Jung was one of the first modern thinkers to trace the spiritual thread which connects the ancient quest for Gnosis to our times, finding a parallel with his own efforts to explore the unconscious. Jung was a deeply religious personality, the most religious person I ever knew. But I think it was his greatness to keep the secret. Jung died in 1961, aged 85. His adult life was spent practicing psychoanalysis in Küsnacht on Lake Zurich. His reputation is based upon his theories of the unconscious dimension of the psyche and his efforts to share the secrets of the soul or the unconscious through dreams. As his secretary and pupil, Aniela Jaffe worked alongside Jung for almost 30 years. Jung was very much interested in all manifestation of mankind coming directly from the unconscious. Now, Gnosticism, or Gnosis, is not an intellectual uh, wisdom, but a wisdom which was expressed by feeling, by, by the unconscious. But Gnosticism was something which gave an insight to the unconscious of man how it functions, these wells of images, pictures, visions, and so on. Therefore, he was very much interested. And also uh, to see how deeply religious the unconscious is. Jung began to study Gnostic ideas in about 1910, while he examined the dreams of both private patients and those in mental hospitals. He revived the Gnostic term archetypes, to describe the mythical and mystical symbols and images that lie below the surface of everyday conscious life, but erupt from the unconscious in dreams. That surely uh, led me on to a uh, profound uh, study of the archetypes. I got more, more uh, respectful of archetypes. And the next uh, question I asked myself was, now where in, where in the world has anybody been busy with that problem? And I found nobody, except uh, a peculiar uh, spiritual movement uh, that uh, went together with the beginnings of Christianity, namely the Gnostics. 
uh, and uh, that was the first thing I showed them that they saw. They were concerned with the problem of archetypes. Jung was a Renaissance man of the 20th century, with a genius for exploring and embracing the most varied fields of religion and philosophy. At one time, he painted Tibetan prayer wheels, or mandalas, expressing one powerful human archetype. It just came to him. It was also such an archetype, you see. And he wrote in his handwriting, this is the first mandala I constructed in the year of 1916, wholly unconscious of what it meant, Xi Jiyong. It's a, a symbol of totality. It is a circle. It has, to my feeling, it has, of course, it has to do with the stars, because the sun is, makes enormous circles of mandala. If you knew his hands, his big man hands, and his very small little <laughs> painting, you see, that's something moving. Jung absorbed the Gnostics' theological myths and symbols and even wrote a short essay in Gnostic style, The Seven Sermons to the Dead. Despite an immense gulf of time, he regarded the Gnostics as his predecessors in the search for spiritual awareness. Uh, they lived, have lived uh, in, the, in the first, second and third century and, uh, and what was in between? Nothing. And now, today, we certainly fall in, into that hole uh, and are confronted by the problems of the collective unconscious, which were then the same in, in 2,000 years ago. And, uh, and we are not prepared to, to meet that problem. Jung called the Gnostic texts he studied well-nigh inexhaustible sources of knowledge for the psychologist. He connected them with the dreams and visions the gods and godlessness of his own patients. His colleague, Professor C.A. Meyer, sees the modern search for spiritual knowledge, which is not satisfied by faith alone, becoming more important than ever. Nowadays, uh, the need for knowledge is ever so much more important than it used to be, while we still were believers, because uh, the majority of people nowadays are no longer believers. They, 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 they cannot be told the old story time and again. They want something, they want to know something and to understand it, and therefore they must be uh, referred to their own experience, which is the unconscious. And that's why we, for instance, ask for people's dreams. What we can observe with our patients is mainly that they suffer from the conditions of this, uh, of this planet. <laughs> and um, that is what the Gnostics were concerned with as well. His thesis was that Gnosticism is not philosophy or speculation or heresy, but that it is simply an experience of the soul. And curiously enough, the Jung Codex which shows you the experience of the Gnostic, of life as a nightmare in this world, until you hear the voice somewhere coming from somewhere of Gnosis. That is a complete confirmation of his thesis that Gnosis is based on an inner experience. Codex I from Nag Hammadi was named the Jung Codex for the first modern scholar who took Gnostic works seriously. Professor Quispel last year retraced the long journey of the papyrus book to the Jabal al-Tarif, where it was found in 1945 by Muhammad Ali al-Saman. I bought one of these books that you found. That was seven years since you discovered it. Ever since I've been working on it, and many other scholars have done too, owing to you. Now 
Muhammad Ali's younger brother sold this one book to a local trader for the price of a new shirt, a Jalabiya. Muhammad Ali himself was in jail for killing his father's murderer in a blood feud. The Codex passed through the hands of optimistic antiquities dealers in Luxor and Cairo to Europe and finally the United States, where the asking price had risen to $25,000. But it found no buyer, and the book remained secretly on offer in Europe. At the Erinus Conference in 1951, an informal annual meeting of scholars convened by Jung, two men agreed that this book should be bought in Jung's name and dedicated to him but ultimately reunited with all the rest in Cairo's Coptic Museum. Gillis Crispel and C. A. Meyer set about the task. And at that decisive moment, Professor Meyer contacted the American citizen, Georgie Page, who lived there in the neighborhood of Zurich, and he gave us 35,000 Swiss francs. I went to Brussels on May the 10th, 1952, and there I acquired the codex, and with the codex under my arm, I returned home. He was, of course, extremely struck by the fact that uh, I mean, he, his, mouth, uh, his mouth stood open when, when he first heard about it. And, uh, and then he was enormously pleased, and he gave this interesting speech, which is published, by the way, uh, at the occasion and uh, de de uh, declaring the interest of uh, Jungian psychology in, in Gnostic material. He is quoted as having said, I have worked all my life uh, to know the psyche, and these people knew already. And it is true that the Gospel of Truth in the Jung Codex is such a vivid illustration of what man's predicament is, according to Jung, that it could have been a falsification by a Jungian, which it is not. For Jung, religious experience was the center of all human experience. His apparent preference was for the Gnostic's symbolic, individual search for religious truth, rather than the mass appeal of the religious dogma which requires unquestioning acceptance. He was very uh, in great awe to the dogma. But uh, he said only fools touch to the dogma. But what is necessary is that we understand it now in a new way. Namely, not as 100% truth, but as a symbol. That is a great thing. That changes everything. What sort of religious upbringing did your father give you? Oh, we were Swiss. Jung created consternation at the end of his life when he gave an apparently Gnostic reply to the most obvious question about his religious outlook. And did you believe in God? Oh, yes. Do you now believe in God? Uh, now? Difficult to answer. I know. I, need, I don't need to believe. I know. I was a secretary at this time. You cannot imagine how many letters arrived. They all wanted to know what he knows. What is true is that he never doubted that there is something which people call God. He never doubted. We can believe, we can believe what you like, but to know that something different. That's the famous phrase of his, you know, I don't believe, I know. But already in 1915, he had made a sort of concept of the world which used Gnostic symbols. He was one of the few people in the Western world who was familiar with Gnostic lore and who saw that they were important for our civilization. The historical stream of Gnosis flowed continuously, despite suppression, and sometimes underground, into Jung's century. Since the Nag Hammadi discovery, biblical scholars and theologians have differed about the value of the Gnostic message for the contemporary world. 
One view is that what the church originally banned as heresy deserves no second hearing now. There are many people among the church leaders as well as among scholars who simply say, well, that material was all considered rubbish in the second century and it's still rubbish now. Um, that is, they don't allow it, as I see it, to raise the basic issue of what, how did a certain book become part of the New Testament? And how did others come to be labeled rubbish? I think that's the interesting question. Um, I think that this material raises all of the fundamental issues of how Christianity came to be in the first place. But the people who disagree with me will say, it was clear that this material from the start was ridiculous. Professor Jonas regards the exclusion of Gnostic dissent as at least a political necessity for the church fathers who defined orthodoxy in response to oppression. Every orthodoxy somehow uh, becomes uh, rigid, but this is probably one of the conditions of its uh, being long-lived. While uh, uh, the church father Irenaeus, the first in the second century, the first to take up the cudgels against the Gnostics and wrote a book against them, blames them that every one of them every day invents something new. And this inventiveness could not be tolerated. There would not have been a consolidated church with its dogma uh, if that would go on. And uh, the suppression of it meant, of course, also a loss. Elaine Pagels wrote her book, The Gnostic Gospels, to explain the Nag Hammadi texts and compare them with the Gospels of the New Testament. She argues that to be aware of the loss of Gnostic ideas gives Christianity a more comprehensible and human flavour. Many people have written to me since I wrote the Gnostic Gospels, and what many people have said, and diverse people, is I didn't feel at home in Christianity the way it was. It can enable one to look at Christian tradition, if you like, with a grain of salt, you know, and not take it necessarily on its own terms, but begin to see how it was formed and begin to accept it as a historical phenomenon and as an imperfect one, if you like. So it, it enables us to look in a completely new way at the history of Christianity. The elements of Gnosticism which have been judged heretical remain controversial and topical today. Debate in the United States over the literal truth of the biblical creation story, or in Britain over the ordination of women, demonstrates the enduring challenge which Gnosticism offers to the established church. It challenges the Catholic and mainstream churches in the way that they claim their authority has pronounced the final word and the beginning word on any topic from the authority of the Pope, um, you know, the ordination of whomever is ordained, uh, the exclusion of women, um, what the resurrection means to Christians and so forth. I mean, all kinds of issues that, in, that are, for very good reasons, to topical today. Gnostics exist today, many perhaps unaware of the tradition which their beliefs and practices follow. A new Californian church has been established, using Nag Hammadi texts as the basis of its scripture, while for the Gnostics, the living Jesus is present everywhere and always. That those whose bodies have died may live in the light of thy gnosis.
The mystery is complete. The right is ended. And the heart I found something that I had been looking for for a long time in a, in a religion, a place where I could feel as a woman um, an active, equal participant, not only in the service itself, but in the philosophy behind the service. When I found the Gnostic Church here in uh, Palo Alto, uh, it was one that resonated well within me as a church which uh, provided me the ritual, the, the contact with God, uh, the, uh, uh, the way through uh, the Eucharist service to my, to my soul uh, without uh, binding me into any kind of, uh, of uh, demand that, that I adhere to a particular doctrinal uh, position. June Singer is a psychoanalyst practicing in Palo Alto, near San Francisco. Lance Beiser is deputy district attorney for Santa Clara County, which includes Palo Alto. Both attend a new church which claims a direct link to Gnostic tradition and uses as its scriptures the Gnostic Gospels of Thomas and Philip, among others found at Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt. It is the childhood opening the eyes. Rosa Miller was born in Longadoc where the 13th century French Gnostic heresy of Catharism flourished. At 19, she experienced a religious transformation in a Cuban prison cell, and later joined the mystical French order of Mary Magdalene. In 1978, ordained as a Gnostic bishop in California, she started the Palo Alto Gnostic Church. is the home of Stanford University and the center of Silicon Valley, synonymous with advances in microprocessing, aerospace technology, home computers, robotics, and artificial intelligence. Camouflaged by a shopping center, the Gnostic Church offers to balance the quest for technology with an inner quest for self-knowledge. Gnostic ideas of the past are treated not as theology and dogma, but as myth and symbol. The alien creation and the world alien to the soul are metaphors to be reinterpreted by the Gnostics of today. It is alien in the sense that the world, and the world as I understand the ancient Gnostics didn't mean creation, the forests and the rivers and the trees and the animals and humans but it meant what is our conception of the world the systems that we create the societies and the beliefs the religions the political systems philosophical beliefs that is totally alien from god hello i'll tell you this is recorded in session the honorable timothy j hannah the presiding Lance Beiser combines his responsibilities within the judicial system as a public prosecutor with the role of ordained minister of the Gnostic Church, seeking to achieve and communicate a spiritual and also moral gnosis. The depths of our psyches are where true decision-making arises inside of us. When anyone, defendant uh, or attorney, approaches uh, life and decisions with respect to uh, whether to steal or whether to defend a person who steals or whether to, uh, in my case, whether to charge someone with a crime and if so, what kind of a crime and at what level, these are all ultimately, at bottom, moral and ethical decisions. The central idea of Gnosticism, the Gnosis Cardius or knowledge of the heart, uh, which is unrelated to intellectual activity, has to do with an individual ability to perceive Truth. Let's hope that she All arrives right, we'll, we'll after a short time. For now. I've already handed the papers to uh, defense counsel for execution, Your Honor. She has a pretty extensive record. Prostitution, 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 soliciting a loot act, transporting marijuana and hashies. Your Honor, I believe some of those are in error. She is not. They're all in error? No, I said some. 
Well, you can throw out some and it still leaves a lot. Yes, Your Honor. However, she is diversion eligible. As I look through the materials here, Your Honor, I note that the probation We all or the, or deal with one another, and, and I see this as a deputy district attorney as well. We all deal with one another from inside of ourselves, and we may justify it after the fact by something we were taught about what God wants of us. But, but down at bottom, we have to make our determinations and decisions. I think that's where... A, a renaissance of, uh, of Gnosis, whether through the Gnostic Church or through other sources, uh, through depth psychology, through readings and philosophy, whatever, are, are truly important for people in society to, to grapple with. Gnostic Church members do not reject the everyday world. They explore the physical and mystical universe creatively rejecting the divisive religious dogmas of the past and present. Gnosis gives them freedom to explore, but not to impose. It is a knowledge of the heart. It is not a knowledge that can be imposed. We all have the equipment and the capability. It's just that we have been deprived from the ability to recognize the frame of reference, that which is constantly within and around us. California today entertains every new religious sect and therapeutic miracle, no matter how eccentric. The Gnostic Church, too, is open to suspicion and skepticism, despite its genuine reiteration of Gnostic tradition. Though it is called a church, it has no evangelical or charitable activities and follows the historic pattern in the rejection of any imposed hierarchy, either of belief or of organization. Our church has no dogmas and no beliefs. Beliefs hinder the experience of Gnosis. I had been used to um, churches where you had to be a member, or you had to be baptized, or you had to um, go to confession, or you had to do something else to be a member of that church and to take communion. In this particular church, you didn't even have to be a, quotes, Gnostic. Thy celestial bride and charming heart. To offer communion to all comers is an openness which amounts to heresy. Rosa Miller is perhaps the world's only bishop who admits to being a heretic. Oh, yes, I would think that I am a heretic. Uh, and if we look in the dictionary, there is a heretic, one that does not conform to church doctrine. A Gnostic cannot conform, not because a Gnostic is a rebel. Rebellion is just the same, it's another aspect of conformism, it's the same thing. So yes, I would consider ourselves heretics. For Lance Beiser, the role of the Gnostic priest is quite different from that role in other churches. It's a role as an intermediary rather than a role as a, as a teacher. Uh, one can teach a foreign language, or how to speak a foreign language. One can teach that Jesus was born at a particular time and died at a particular time, and that his death has certain kind of meaning. That kind of, that kind of information is not the same as, uh, as knowledge of what religion is, what God is, what our role in society is. That is not something that can either be taught or in a way it can even be communicated. Uh, there's a line from the, the Tao Te Ching that says that you, the, the Tao that can be taught isn't the true Tao. Well, Gnosis that can be taught isn't the true Gnosis either. A woman bishop is the most conspicuous evidence of the Gnostic tradition of women playing a full and equal role in religious practice. The feminine is given equality with the masculine in all images and metaphors of God and the Divine Spirit. It does what I think is absolutely necessary in our time, and that is to seek that balance of the masculine and the feminine, so that each one, uh, the male and the female, can express himself or herself according to that particular nature of that individual. 
But if you can go back in history and see the theme repeated again and again as this theme of the balance of the masculine and the feminine, how that is expressed in Gnosticism, in alchemy, in Taoism, in Hindu philosophy, over and over again, you begin to realize that it has substance. It's not just an idea that some psychiatrist thought of in the 20th century. Honoring the feminine is also a Gnostic correction to the narrative story of Christianity. Gnostics have traditionally regarded Mary Magdalene, Mariam in the Nag Hammadi Codices, as unique among the apostles, not only as the sole woman, but for being closest in spirit to Christ. She has been uh, vilified, she's been considered a fallen woman, and yet um, what woman hasn't fallen in one way or another? The image of the virgin, the pure woman whose um, right to be worshipped comes because she has borne a divine child, is a beautiful and wonderful image, but it's a very hard one to live up to. In a church which shuns dogma and exalts Mary Magdalene, the orthodox ritual of the Mass is unexpected. The majority of the texts in the Gnostic Eucharist service are Nag Hammadi scriptures, though newly invented prayers and hymns are also used. The order of service largely follows the Catholic Mass. There is incense with a whiff of orthodoxy and a canopy over the altar like the chuppah at a Jewish wedding for the marriage of masculine and feminine. The women ordinands around the altar and the wine of the Eucharist are veiled to conceal their mystery. In the veils in the women symbolize the same thing as the transformation of the bread and the wine. It's a veil in which the divinity, the presence of the extraordinary Christ, God, whatever you want to call it, hides. The Eucharist, the symbolic transformation of wafers and wine into the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, has a different meaning in the Gnostic Church. The symbolism of the ceremony here contrasts with the remembrance which is enacted in the mainstream Christian churches. The theology is different, and so is the psychological experience, according to June Singer. As I understand the symbolism of the Eucharist in the Orthodox Christian Church, the Eucharist is a celebration and a commemoration of an important event that happened 2,000 years ago. In the Gnostic Church, this is not the case. Uh, it's an experience that's happening right now in this place, and we're living it. We don't need to believe that such and such happened in such and such a certain time. It may have happened, may not have happened. This is a new church practicing an old heresy. Its novelty may attract more followers than its claim to Gnostic traditions. The Palo Alto Gnostics say that Gnosis has never been a specific belief, but a matter of perception. And in an age of growing fundamentalism, they have rediscovered a spiritual pulse which feels true to them as a matter of real experience. You can't be a Gnostic if all you do is accept what someone else told you. And I think there are a lot of people like that in society, and they find themselves in all kinds of churches. The Gnostic Church is, I think, simply a way of providing an opportunity for those maybe to come together with other people of like mind. But that doesn't imply that, in, in, that it's going to be a church to, to uh, uh, grapple with the, the Christian Church for uh, dominance in our society. Uh, the Gnostic Church in the early centuries uh, didn't do so well. I suspect that a Gnostic Church today wouldn't do any better if it were truly a political uh, uh, struggle. Holy Spirit, Celestial Bride and Revealed. These are the first Gnostics in history who are free to express their heresy. They do not face repression or slaughter. Their names do not belong in the famous tradition of Valentinus, Hermes Trismegistus, Gilabert de Castro, Pico de la Mirandola, John Dee, and Carl Jung. Today, they believe that Gnosis has value for all humanity, despite its checkered history. Gnosis itself can 
the same way that it cannot be held in a book, it cannot be destroyed either. So it does not matter if all Gnostics are killed and all the documents are destroyed, there will be Gnostics always. The most powerful theme of Gnosticism is the sense that men and women are outsiders in a meaningless world, but that they can overcome the troubles and materialism of everyday life by ignoring the false images of the Demiurge, the creator of the earth, and finding the common identity between their own soul and the divinity of God. Such an idea is clearly echoed in modern existentialist philosophy. The term alienation is not foreign to us. Uh, a man does not feel so comfortably at home in the world that surrounds him. Certainly one common feature and also uh, some consciousness of a crisis and um, even nihilistic tendencies uh, and an estrangement. Gnostic tradition offers an answer to the atheists or the agnostics question, did a good God create a world full of pain and suffering? Modern life, for countless millions, is estranged from hope. War, hunger and natural disasters afflict some. Drugs, brutality, AIDS and disability oppress others. The Gnostic does not blame God for the punishment but seeks to know God in order to accept the unavoidable tragedy inherent in life itself. Every new human life is seen as a certain source of distress, mingled with the possibility of hope for the individual who finds a way to salvation through that knowledge of the heart. I think about Orthodox Christian tradition, which says that suffering and pain come into the world because of human sin and because of original sin. You know, there, there, there would not be any suffering of the innocent, according to St. Augustine. Valentinus's view strikes me as, as, a, as, a, as an interesting alternative when he says that suffering is part of the fabric of the human race, in the, the part of the fabric of existence into which we're born, uh, not so simple as to trace it to human fault. The two outstanding moods or attitudes of the Gnostic mind and of distress and hope. It expresses in a certain way a, a central experience of the Gnostic mind, namely of being strangers in a strange world uh, into which the soul or the spirit does not originally belong and from which it has to extricate itself. And God stands, the true God, as distinct from the creator God, from the demiurge, um, stands also in the relation of, of an alien to this world. And his message appears in the world as something from without. Without faith or without gnosis, the message of the true God remains alien and abstract. For the Gnostic, the world is an illusion which only spiritual vision can make real and meaningful. The world is seen by most of these Gnostics as a place where you have to become conscious. Sin is a word that is not to be found in that dictionary. It is all about ignorance, being unconscious of yourself, and then the appeal of Christ makes yourself conscious of what you are. And therefore, the world is there to prepare mankind for full consciousness. Every branch of Christianity looks to the second coming of Christ, whether in symbolic or literal terms. For the Gnostics, Christ the twin is always alongside showing the way to the knowledge of the heart, which is their salvation. Christ's message of Gnosis is to be heard even amid the hectic human chaos of New York City.
shall give you what no eye has seen, and what no ear has heard, and what no hand has touched, and what has never occurred to the human mind. It is I who am the light which is above them all. It is I who am the all. From me did the all come forth, and unto me did the all extend. Split a piece of wood, and I am there. Lift up the stone, and you will find me there. The kingdom will not come by waiting for it. Will not be a matter of saying here it is or there it is. Rather, the kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth, and men do not see it. Woe to you, godless ones! Who have no hope, who rely on things that will not happen. Woe to you, who hope in the flesh and the prison that will perish. Your hope is set upon the world, and your God is this life. You are corrupting your soul. Woe to you for the fire that burns in you, for it is insatiable. And woe to you for the wheel that turns in your mind. Woe to you, captives. For you are bound in caverns. You laugh. In mad laughter you rejoice. Some have entered the kingdom of heaven laughing, and they have come out. For two thousand years the Gnostic pulse has been beating. Men and women have pursued a deeper experience of their spiritual nature than what is offered formally by faith through the church. The authors of the Gnostic texts and all those who have followed them in Christian history have been denounced as heretics, and some have paid with their lives. It is those who are awake I have addressed. I tell you this that you may know yourselves. If you know the truth, the truth will make you free. within a man of light and he lights up the whole world if he does not shine he is darkness do you dare to spare the flesh you for whom the spirit is an encircling wall if you consider how long the world existed before you and how long it will exist after you you will find your life to be one single day and your sufferings one single hour for the good will not enter the world scorn death therefore and take thought for life. Remember my cross and my death, and you will live. In 1945, the year of liberation and catastrophe, the Gnostic tradition's earliest traces were discovered in the Egyptian desert, and the Gnostic idea has become widely available to the people of a freer, more dangerous world. A timeless message for the human spirit has emerged from the silence of human history. Who is it that will rain a refreshing dew upon you to extinguish the mass of fires in you? Who is it who will cause the sun to shine upon you and disperse the darkness in you and hide the darkness and polluted water? Henceforth, waking or sleeping, remember 
you have seen the Son of Man, and spoken with him in person, and listened to him in person. If it is true that life is tragic and not moral, then Gnosticism gives a better answer to certain questions than the traditional morals of Christianity. Because you see then uh, that whatever you do, it is always wrong, and you have peace with that. You can accept the tragical aspect of existence and be tolerant towards the tragedy of others. Thank you.